let me make some comments then. If you will turn to page 244. Two forty-four. It's the first full paragraph. We're going to read an extended portion of this because I want you to see how uh, Dr. Pavlak uh, uh, treats the Industrial Revolution before we jump <coughs> into the base on lecture. And I want us to kind of explore that and see if there's something that, that we can take away from his thoughts or if there's something we want to reject from his thoughts in the reading. He says this, or writes this, in the process... Western civilization perfected the greatest invention in human history. Mm -hmm. Indoor plumbing. Amen. Oh, that is an amen, actually. Because hot and, cold, uh, hot and cold running water and toilet for a water closet, such mundane items are often take for, taken for granted by both historians and ordinary people. Because the Romans had public lavatories and baths, some medieval monasteries had interesting systems of water supply. And a few monarchs and aristocrats had unique plumbing built into the palace here or there. But since the fall of Rome, cleanliness had been too expensive for most people to bother with. Whether rich or poor, most people literally stank and crawled with vermin. In the 19th century, free-flowing water from public waterworks, copper pipes, gas heaters, uh, valves, and porcelain bowls brought the values of hygienic cleanliness to people at all levels of wealth. Note that, all levels of wealth. Of course, not all worries can go down the drain or vanish with a flush. The waste merely accumulated somewhere else in the environment. It's an interesting <clears throat> observation that he makes. Probably gives you a little bit of insight into his uh, personal <clears throat> sense, a political sense. Mm -hmm. Most people unconcerned have easily ignored such messy realities. Regardless, more and more 19th century Westerners enjoyed the cleanliness and comforts of lavatories and new plumbing. Plagues like cholera, typhoid, and dysentery began to diminish and even disappear in the West. What do you think he hints at in that paragraph as far as his own personal political persuasion is concerned? It's environmentalist green. So environmentalist yeah. green. That, yeah. What do you think about that? Should we be environmentalists? We should. I think okay, why, Michael? Yeah. Because we're supposed to take care of what God's given us to, to reign over. Genesis 1. Correct. We've been given a mandate mm -hmm. to care for creation, mm -hmm. to oversee and rule creation. Sure. As long as we don't take care of the environment, uh, in a sense, <coughs> come back and bite us somehow. Like the effects of um, us not taking care of the environment will eventually come back and hurt us. In what sense? Uh, I mean, like, hmm. <clears throat> do you think? Do you, are you saying that because you think nature has feelings? <laughs> no, no. If, if you accumulate, like, what he's saying, if you accumulate uh, enough trash or whatever else, the waste, <clears throat> um, it's going to build up. I mean, you build up, you're going to run out of place to put it. You run out of place to put it, then. The stuff that we got rid of, the uh, typhoid and everything else, and that's going to start affecting us again because instead of being cleanly, like instead of having that cleanliness and putting it somewhere else, we don't have a place to put it. We're forced to just put it right outside our door. Okay. We do that. Well, eventually, if we don't take care of the environment, we'll destroy it. Okay. I think it's a fine line. I think you have to balance between falling into um, idolizing the creation and maybe putting too much stock into our creation, but then also having dominion over it and you know being a good steward of it. And so, like most things, it's a tightrope you have to balance. Well, one of the reasons I bring this up. Go ahead, James. I was just going to say is. Uh, uh, Today's world uh, views the environment basically scientific in terms of God. Uh, you know, and they raise uh, the environmental issues above God Himself. Uh, in the world. Yeah, it's ab absolutely true. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons I bring it up is this is a, a political topic that it'll affect the next presidential election. Uh, somebody, people are going to have to answer for what they think about 
the environment, their care of the environment, uh, global warming, man-made global warming, climate change, and all of those sort of topics are hot-button political topics. And particularly among people my age and younger. Uh, because, you know, you guys sense that and see that, and you look at the world and say, we shouldn't trash it. And I agree with that. I think biblically, we as Christians have been given a mandate to take care of the world. I think there's a, there's a, a, a philosophical difference between where Dr. Pavlak comes from and where we may come from. We come from it from the perspective that God gave us rule and ownership over creation. In other words, creation is ours to rule. It's the way God designed it, which means we can use creation. Uh, many on the other side of the political aisle on this particular topic look at creation as equal or valid, or in some cases, if you look at recent storylines, creation itself, animal life, or the life of the planet, is equally valid with human life. In other words, we're all part of the same creation, so, or they wouldn't use the term creation, we're all part of the same ecosystem. And so we're, everything's equally valid. A lion is equally <coughs> valid with a human. Or Mother Earth is equally valid with you know, human, human existence. What I think is fascinating, though, here and how Dr. Pavlak, <coughs> and, and the, what illustrates my point, is that advances in indoor plumbing and dealing with trash literally saved millions of lives over the last... 150 to 200 years. Uh, when we were in Kenya last year, one of our team members got typhoid. And we tried everything. We didn't know what she had. She got typhoid, and we, I mean, we were scared to death she was going to die. I mean, she was hallucinating. Her fever was at 104 point something. And you're talking about a place where you don't have Mission Hospital. You don't even have Part E Hospital down the street. You have nothing that you can go to and expect her to survive, and we didn't know what was going on with her. And thank goodness there was a doctor close enough to be able to run a typhoid test, which is still a relatively common disease in that part of Africa, found out she had typhoid, got a shot, and she was, she was fine. Thank goodness for modern medicine. And the modern medicine has reached places like Kenya. But just think if that was the common everyday experience like it was, 150 or 200 years ago, the reality is the Industrial Revolution would have brought for us is it gave people a better standard of living. And I don't mean houses and cars. I mean indoor plumbing in the sense that we don't have to worry about getting a disease every time we drink a glass of water. <clears throat> That's huge. Life expectancy from the Industrial Revolution to today has almost doubled. Just think about that. You know why people are living in 75 and 80? So they have clean water. And toilets that flush. And indoor plumbing. And we're able to deal with trash actually rather than just <coughs> throw it outside and let it fester and let it... You know. It's amazing what has happened in our, in, in our era. And I think Mr. Pavlak, Dr. Pavlak, what he does here is he hints at kind of his, his world view that says... Okay, people's lives were saved, but we still have a mess on our hands. Where I, as I think w the way we should look at it is people's lives were saved. Yes, we have more to do, but who's the crowning jewel of creation in a biblical worldview? It's not Cecil the Lion, and it's not Mother Earth. It's man, because God created us in his image. And so the Industrial Revolution the advances in technology that you and I experience the benefit of are for man. They're for us. Not for someone else. Now there are problems with the Industrial Revolution and problems with how it affected children and workforce labor and things of that sort. And we'll talk about a few of those as we go on with the lecture. My point being, it's a good thing. It's not a thing we should look back at and reject. If you like to flush a toilet and drink clean water, should be thankful for the Industrial Revolution. And it just comes across here like he says, that's okay, that's good, but then it's not good enough. Okay, we still got a lot of work to do. Does that make sense? Uh, look at the next, 
or the last paragraph there that starts with meanwhile, page 244, we're going to read two other paragraphs, and I want you to, uh, again, hint at, or see where Dr. Pavlik hints at his worldview. Meanwhile, the middle class became less that of the merchants and artisans and more the managers and professionals, the white-collar worker who supervised the blue-collar workers in the factories. The colors reflect class distinctions, white for more expensive bleached and pressed fabric, Blue for cheaper and darker cloth, they showed less dirt. Physicians, lawyers, professors, likewise, earned enough to qualify for the upper middle class way of life. But that's not always entirely true about professors, by the way. <laughs> Most people came to idealize middle class values. <coughs> a separate home is a refuge from the rough everyday world. A wife who didn't have to work outside the home, if at all. And the freedom to afford vacations and comfortable retirement in old age. Hold that last sentence in your mind. And then he says, essentially, these middle class values were new, unusual, and limited to only a few. This, these so called family values were not at all traditional, as some social conservatives today would like people to think. Throughout civilized history, most men and women have actually worked at home or close to the home on the land. The entire family worked together husband, wife, children, perhaps with a few others in servile status. Most people never thought of vacation trips, only restful religious holidays. Those who survived in old age usually had to keep working to earn their keep. And we'll stop there. What do you think about, do you agree with his definition of middle class values? Separate home, a wife who didn't have to work, no. vacations, comfortable retirement. Would that separate home be like a vacation home? No, he's mean? talking about a home outside the workplace. Like in, in a sense where you didn't necessarily work where you lived or you had a, had a place to live that was separate and distinct from from job. You don't agree with that, Myron? You don't like his definition of middle class values there? <clears throat> the, the separate home... Um, I actually was kind of thinking what what he was saying. A vacation, you know, like a vacation. Yeah, he's not home talking home about a vacation home. home that's a you know, product like of poor writing and poor editing. He could have been more clear with that, but I don't think he's talking about a vacation home because you're talking about one percent of Americans. If you're talking about a vacation home or less, right. I don't have a vacation. Well, my, my wife, my wife don't work. Uh, she stays home, homeschools the kids. Uh, you know, takes care of the household. In some ways, I don't have a problem with these, his definition of middle class values. Right. I, I don't think those are problematic. What I want you to see is what he does in the very next sentence. Essentially, these middle class values were new, unusual, and limited to only a few. Which, to an extent, there's some truth there. But also, it's limited to a few because the population was way less 125 years ago than it was than it is today. And while it may be less of a reality that, say, a wife can stay at home and not have to work, although that is a reality for many, it's not a reality for everyone, that's something that we would strive for, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think it's wrong for us to go with those type of values in a middle-class economy. I don't think that that's a problem. Here's where I think it's problematic. He then goes in the next sentence to say these so-called family values were not at all traditional as some social conservatives would like people to think. What are family values? Biblical values. Well, as he, as he defines it, what are family values? Yeah. What he does is connect family values with middle class values. And says they're the same thing. Which to me is very problematic for a whole host of reasons. Number one, he didn't define family values other than to connect them to middle class values. I don't think family values and middle class values are the same at all. As a social conservative, and I would be one, simply because I look at the scripture as my authority and the scripture teaches me to look at social issues a certain way. So scripture is going to dictate to me what I, how I think about issues regarding abortion or issues regarding homosexual marriage or issues regarding the economy for that matter. I'm going to let scripture be my determining factor for how I view those issues. So I would say I'm a social conservative. But I don't identify middle class values and family values as the same thing. 
Family values should be separate no matter what socioeconomic background you live. That's right, because we look, as a social conservative, we look at family values from where? Where do you think we get our idea of family values? Bible. Scripture. Yeah. Social values. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's sad, but I think it's indicative of Dr. Pavlak's perspective why he makes some connections that are problematic. And what I want you to be able to do, and you're going to have to do when you get further along into your educational career, either here at Fruitland or uh, in other classes, be able to read a book critically. Be able to look through a text like this and find out where you see something that's problematic, where you see something that's worthy of critique. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Sure. That's what's up. Uh, all the thing I can bother to do with his writing or stands out in my mind is that what's not there. You know, yes. As an Episcopal minister, you would think he would know better and would somehow tie some of this to, to Scripture or to God or to, you know, church. Well, it's not authoritative for him. Right. Scripture is not authoritative for his uh, work as a historian, which we looked at last quarter as being problematic, and, mm -hmm. and we, we actually will continue to see that. Well, is that what he thinks family values are today? Yeah, he connects family values to middle class values. I mean, I, I think it's great if my wife wouldn't have to work, but that's just not reality. Right. Not in our home, not currently. Plus, on the other side, my wife wants the sanity of work. <laughs> and anybody with young kids kind of understands that. I mean, it's not she doesn't work full time, but working with adults, interacting with adults, is sanity for her. When you're talking about two boys, so uh, again, his his identification is where I, what I find problematic. Myron, I'm looking on page two fifty nine. Um, this I don't like his viewpoint here. If Wait, you can you be specific? Uh, Show me where you The second full paragraph, about the middle of the paragraph. Okay. Uh, Read it for says, us. They fear workers would aspire to uh, rise uh, above their assigned social <clears throat> level. And it goes on to say that is why, even in the West today, a university education is considered a ticket to a middle class lifestyle. And I really don't. I, I really don't see that, especially in today's economy. Well, I mean, it's not college well, jobs coming out working in college. What year was it? He wrote this in uh, two thousand eleven. So it's, it was published in two thousand eleven. So it's in the middle of a, the middle of a down economy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily think. I think what he's doing there is again indicating his. <clears throat> he's indicating his bias. Because while that's not reality, that's the perspective. <coughs> if you listen to many politicians, and I think both sides of the aisle are guilty of this, many politicians suggest that a college education or a proper, uh, a proper um, uh, primary, middle school, and high school education, as it should be, and college education should give you a chance to get a job. They, they kind of make that case. Well, I think education is a good thing. I mean, I, yeah. I, I've, got a, I've got a PhD. I mean, I think it's a great thing, but it's not a ticket. The problem is it's perceived as a ticket. You go get an education, you get a degree, you're going to have a job. That's not always true. And you've also got to rethink, and this is maybe a topic for a different day, although we're here, so I'll touch on it. You don't get education for a job. That's the mindset of most people. It is the mindset of most people. It's what's preached to them. Right. From politics on through uh, you know, media, uh, technology, everything preaches. You get a degree so you can get a job. Right. That's not why you get education. You know why you get an education? Yeah. So you can think. A proper view of education is to sharpen your mind. That's why a liberal arts <coughs> education... Uh, which would be constitute this, the seven liberal arts, the original liberal arts that were taught in uh, Roman societies in the 300, 400, 500 A.D., would be the quadrivium of, let me see if I get this right, um, rhetoric, logic, see, the trivium would have been arithmetic, uh, well, and I'm, somebody look that up. 
Severin Liberal uh, so Severin Liberal Arts. Just trying to get that right. Thanks, Will. And um, it looks like the his bias. Sorry. Uh, grammar, rhetoric, logic, uh, the trivium. Grammar, rhetoric, and logic, the trivium. And, yes. Uh, geometry, arithmetic, <coughs> music, astronomy, the quadrivium. Quadrivium. The seven liberal arts were originally designed that 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 would give you a grounded, a well-rounded educational perspective <coughs> or, or uh, you know, uh, intellectual perspective on the way the world works. It's ancient philosophy. That was adopted, and by the way, when we use the term a liberal arts school, liberal arts mean those. Well, historically they mean those. Practically today they don't mean those. Because if you go off to the University of North Carolina <laughs> Chapel Hill, or you go off to Gardner Webb, or you go off to, uh, I don't know, University of South Carolina, wherever, you're not going to get taught in those seven things. There may be a sense of a foundation from some of those, but what are you taught when you go off to one of those schools? You're given a major tract so that you can go get trained to get a job. Why do you think philosophically that's the case? Why do you think in our educational atmosphere today, the goal is to get you a job, not to train you in those particular seven liberal arts? Somebody throw it out there. Why do you think that's the I case? I think so the upper class can still continue to be supported by the working class. Okay, what, that's, one, per that's on one perspective. <coughs> here. That's one it? perspective. Why else? <coughs> Why do you think in most... <coughs> I think most is safe to say. <coughs> I couldn't say all, but <coughs> let me say most. Most academic <coughs> focuses whether it's high school or whether it's college, they train you to get a job. I mean, so when you go to college, you're going to major in, I don't know, being a nursing tech. You're going to get a degree in nursing. That's what you're going to do, right? Or get a degree in theology or get a degree in whatever. Why do they train you to get a job and not particularly train you in these seven liberal arts? Yeah. So you support yourself with a job? What else? Because the view of success isn't how much you know, but whenever you have a stable job and whenever, I mean, family value. Really, they want you to be dumb cheap. Yeah, there you go, James. You've hit on it. I, I wouldn't put it quite in those terms. But here's, here, here's, what, here's what our culture and society says today. You need a job and you need to support your family, but we don't want you to think about the world. And that's not, that is not just one political party. Yeah. That's our entire educational paradigm. What we want to do here at this college is help you think. I want you to go get a job. I want you to be able to support your parent, your family. But you already know going into ministry that you're not going to get rich. If he was talking about vacation homes, you can forget it. Okay. You may get a home, you may get a house, but it's probably not going to be, you know, 500,000 or 5,000 square feet. You get that, right? I want you to get a job. But you know what I want more than you getting a job? I want you to think. Our desire here is for you to use your brains. And why should you be trained in mathematics and in grammar, rhetoric, and logic? Why should you be trained in, in, uh, in, in fields of science, <coughs> astronomy? Why should you be trained in those fields? Why? What do you think? Make the world a better place. Well, understanding the world, yes, and then you can make the world a better, be better place. People who think, think deeply and think broadly. They just don't think about one specific topic. It's one of the reasons why here we're dealing with history. You think, why in the world do we have to deal with history at a Bible college? Because if you don't understand history, you can't make proper connections in the fields of theology or field of evangelism or field of apologetics like we're going to go into in my next class here. If you don't understand history, it, you might as well not even study the rest of those. Because the developments in theology and apologetics and evangelism and everything we're dealing with in our culture today flow out of what's happened historically. Why should you learn math? And why should you learn astronomy? And why should you work in those fields? Well, religion's done that as well in the past. Like you talk about the French Revolution, 
That's why it's important that we know what the Bible says and have our own copy of the Word and everything. Absolutely. You know? And you shouldn't just read about theological topics. Yeah. Shouldn't. You should. When, when society looks at society looks at the level of education as far as what the jo the job in which you're looking for. Sure, and I don't <clears throat> think that's always inappropriate. Okay, I'm not saying it's a bad thing for you to get uh, trained in a specific field to get a specific job. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. The problem is that's an entire educational. That is our educational model today. Right. Our educational model, higher education, is about you getting trained in a specific field to get a specific job. Because if you know nursing, that's great. But the reality is, and what Alexis de Tocqueville spoke to about America in, when he wrote uh, Democracy in America, 1815, 1815s, he came, or 18-teens, he came to the United States, took a tour of the United States, and he commented on what made the United States great. And one of his statements was this. Everybody thinks, everybody reads, everybody can engage in commentary in a political, in the political process or in the philosophical process because even if they're farmers, they read. They think. You know, the problem with our culture and society today is far deeper than a political problem and it's far deeper than it. It, it is a spiritual problem, but it's more interconnected than it just being a spiritual problem. Part of the problem with our culture today, as a whole, is that it's an ignorance problem. We get our news from places like TMZ. and That's where people get educated on the issues of politics. I mean, here's when you know it's bad, okay? You know it's bad when Rush Limbaugh... Mm -hmm talks about, like, TMZ stuff. When his commentary, his political commentary, is talking about personalities in, in, uh, in, in uh, movie personalities, you know it's bad. When he's talking about Kim Kardashian, you know it's bad. And what, my point being, they have to interact with the news stories of the day. And news stories of the day are entertainment driven. Not driven by real issues and real conversations and real discussions. Then who are the puppeteers of the ones that are who do you leading, think? leading our country? Because if, if that be the case... And that's a great question, they're getting, they're getting the same education and don't have the ability to think. You're exactly right. It's exactly right. So who are the puppeteers? People with money. Donald Trump. Donald Trump say it was. There you go. But that's that's my point. That's why you should think. I don't care if you listen to Rush Limbaugh or Glenn Beck, or if you listen to Chris Matthews, or you listen to Anderson Cooper. Whoever you watch and whoever you listen to, fine. But don't just think like them because you hear what they say. Same thing with the politicians on stage last night, or if you watch a Democratic uh, uh, primary debate. It's fine. I, I don't care who you support or where you are politically. Think. Don't be a robot. Don't let someone speak into one ear and then you speak out what they say from your mouth. Use your brain. And that's why you should be trained in things more than just your field of study. That's why you, as a, a, a going into ministry, you better read in fields beyond theological. What is the college, of the, uh, and several of our presidents have been that uh, college in Europe if it's a scholar? Are they, are they Cambridge. Rogue, are they considered rogue, rogue scholars? Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that has to, has to do more with, uh, I think that has to do more with, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't want to speak to something that I'm not sure about. <clears throat> Seems like that's a, another level of education that, some of our presidents have had that it's not privileged to the average person, I guess. Well, so I'll, I'll, I mean, you can get wild. there. Any of you guys <clears throat> can go be Rhodes Scholars. Well. <laughs> <laughs> the possibility is there for any of you to do that. 
but it requires much work, <laughs> much sharpening of brain intelligence. Oh, that's another thing. Uh, and and to, to an extent, uh, processes like that sometimes are political. It's who you know. Uh, it's what opportunity you should be given. The reality is, when, listen, I'm a poor country boy from a pastor's home in Hickory, North Carolina, and I have a Ph.D., the opportunities are available to any of you guys Amen. if you'll study and work hard. Amen. All right. Now I was blessed with be, having a, being at a place where I could continue doing that. Sure, but God knows who you are and knows where you are. And if you've got a propensity toward that, He's going to give you an opportunity. Amen. The challenge for you, and the challenge for all of us sitting here. Uh, in this room is to take advantage of the opportunities God puts in front of you and not squander them and waste them. Amen. Your brains are too important. <laughs> and you thinking is way more important. I want you all to do well in this class. I want you to make A's. And I think I try to weight the course to where if you do the work, you're going to do well. And you're, whether you get an A or a C is dependent on how you do on the final exam. Because if you do all the other work, you've got to be in the class. <coughs> you walk in the class with a B if you do everything else you're supposed to do. All right? So intelligence is important. You know, learning things is important. But what I want out of this class, where I, where I look at myself and say I've done a good job with students, is helping you realize that you need to think. Getting an A is good. Thinking is best. Make sense?